Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. I'm your host, Ben Carson. So happy to be with you. I'm pleased to welcome Congresswoman Beth Van Dyne, who represents Texas's 24th Congressional District. But, uh, you know, she's been doing a lot more than that. She was uh, the former mayor of Irving, Texas, uh, a former head colleague, HUD colleague, when she was the regional administrator for the um, Southwest region. And in fact, she was uh, the very first regional administrator uh, for HUD during the Trump administration. She's also a businesswoman. She's a mother. She's a true patriot. She's a great friend. We love having her. Welcome, Beth. Thank you very much, Secretary. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. And um, you know, many things happened during uh, our time at HUD, but I never thought in my in my my, my years there that you would ever be introducing me. So <laughs> <laughs> that was that was an honor. <laughs> well, it's it's great. You know, um, I think a good place to start is maybe you could tell us about some of the bills you've uh, introduced to expand housing yeah. and lower the cost because. You know, one of the things that was so perplexing at HUD was uh, all the regulations and things that were not catching up. Uh, we, we weren't keeping up with technology, and uh, we left things. And when I say we, I'm talking about the government in general over many years, leave things in place that are outdated. and. Um, what, what are some of the things that, that you've worked on in this area? Oh, I appreciate I appreciate the question. And yeah, I mean, I, I was I was only at HUD for two and a half years. I know that you were there for for all four years. And we it was impossible to try to change some of these things that are just habit forming. And you've got bureaucrats that are there for decades that are so established in what they do that, you know, sometimes it doesn't really matter who is in uh who's in office, trying to get that change down at the level where it's actually executed is, it, it's, it's, it's tough. It's very difficult. But two of the bills that I am trying to, uh, trying to pass is really to help people get into home ownership. You, I think, said it brilliantly. Um, when I used to hear you speak, you would talk about generational wealth. And, and how important it is for people to actually own property, own property that they are able to, to, to not only have while they're alive, but then to be able to leave to their kids, breaking cycles of poverty, giving them an opportunity to have you know, much more um, um, value on the books um, and, and less likely to fall into homelessness, less likely to fall into poverty. So I think it's it's behooves us as government officials to try to do whatever we can to help people who want to own a home to be able to do that. Um, some of the things that we found is exactly what you're talking about is regulations and cost. And years ago, when we looked at the cost of, of building a new home, for example, in California, 40% of that new cost had to do with regulatory fees. And a big part of that was ba is, uh, Davis Bacon. And I know that you're trying to change that when you're secretary. We were unable to do that because it's so established. But mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to get a bill that would get rid of Davis Bacon. Basically, what Davis Bacon does is it forces um, con um, um, contractors to be to pay their folks what they consider prevailing wages. But there's no way of defining what the prevailing wage is and the way that they used to come come about it. It was not, it was, it was different, you know, depending on what city, what area you were in, what state you were in. Um, and it really made no sense. But what we do, do know is that it, it drastically increased the cost of building a new home. So one of the bills that we have is, uh, is, is attacking Davis Bacon and getting rid of that. Even the people who worked in Davis Bacon didn't approve, you know, approve of Davis Bacon. Um, and the second thing that I'm trying to do is make sure that people can take money that they are putting away in, in, in an IRA and right. put it away into a home. So years ago, when uh, they set the limit to $10,000, the average home price was a little over $100,000. Well, you know, we dressed, you know, fast forward when the average cost now of a home is over $300,000. I want to increase the amount that people can put away for a home, take out of their IRA from 10000 to 30000 
I think these are just kind of common sense um, ways that could help people be able to put investment in their future, in their children's future, and to really cut the uh, the idea that that everybody uh, has to live in a in a in a, uh, in a rental home, but but that we really can start owning their own their own future. That's the uplifting first time home buyer that. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I, that makes so much sense, but. Uh, What's the likelihood of it getting passed? You know how things that make sense don't get passed. Well, I think I think it's got a good likelihood with this Congress to get passed. We'll see if we can actually uh, get it in the Senate, get it passed out of the Senate. But I think it makes sense if we are really serious about people owning homes. It makes a lot more sense than what we're seeing um, coming out of the White House uh, just last week, which is you know hurting people who have great credit and who have worked hard to get good credit and uh, um, punishing them while people who have poor credit, uh, you know, allowing them to take money off on their, on their mortgage, uh, on their mortgage rate. It's in, that is insane. But, but I think if we're really serious about it, there are different ways that are mu- much more fair, uh, and much more effective. Well, if, if anybody can poke them and make them do it, it's you. So. <laughs> um, you know, you've been uh, pointed to the very prestigious uh, Ways and Means Committee. Yeah. Uh, what's, it, what's that been like? You know, I, I have really appreciated being on that committee. It's only been a few months, but uh, under Chairman Jason Smith, we have gone out and we've done field hearings, um, which have been phenomenal. Normally, we force people to come to D.C. It's very intimidating. You know, we stand up on our dais and, uh, and we question our witnesses. Um, but this has been much different. We've gone out. We've gone to places like West Virginia. We've gone to Oklahoma. Um, we just got out of Georgia uh, this past week where we're going in and we're talking to small businesses and we're saying, how directly are the policies that are coming out of this administration affecting your small business? Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. Even when you talk to, to places as different as Georgia, West Virginia and Oklahoma, you're hearing the same thing. They're talking about inflation and how that is absolutely killing their ability to be able to purchase things. They're talking about supply chain issues and then what that's causing to have to force them to increase prices. They're talking about not being able to hire people um, because people are getting paid more to stay at home. They can't compete with what the government is giving them not to work. So over and over again, no matter what industry and no matter what area of the country that we're in, that's what we're hearing. And on Ways and Means, as you know, it's the oldest established committee in Congress. I would say it's the most influential and the strongest committee in Congress. Absolutely. But yeah. our ability to be able to help business owners and to be able to help those um, those working families that are being hit the hardest right now by these economic policies and these fiscal policies coming out of this White House, I think is extreme. And, and, and we're, we're doing our job. We're listening. Um, we're responding, and let's hope that we can get uh, passage of our bills through the Senate and then to get signed by the president. Well, it's very comforting to uh, to me and to many others to know that they're fiscally responsible people like yourself who are overseeing what's going on there. But uh, thinking about people who are not fiscally responsible, uh, what can you tell us about what's driving the Biden administration's extreme climate policies? Yeah, I mean, I can't. I wish I, I wish I could understand the sense of what they're doing. Um, it just seems like they are block by block taking away um, U.S. Um, um, ability to be able to compete globally, U.S. ability to be able to complete compete domestically. Um, we are, look, I, I'm from the state of, of Texas. You're from Florida. Uh, you know, we, we, we have chosen to live in states that get it and understand how to govern, uh, how to govern where people want to live in our, in our state. Um, you know, people we're, are, are coming down from California. They're coming down from New York because they understand what's, what's happening in, in those two states specifically and how it's crushing their ability to be able to make a living and to be able to invest in their futures. So if you think about what the Biden administration is doing, on its green tax credits and its green tax plan, um, it's really making and demonizing our energy industry in the U.S. It is making it imp- nearly impossible for it to be able to compete. We're seeing inflation as a direct result of these policies. They are picking winners and losers. They're looking at um, EV vehicles, for example, completely ignoring the fact that how are EV vehicles built? You know, where are we reliant on to get those necessary pieces, materials. It's China. So we are emboldening, enriching, empowering China 
at the um, at, at the loss of the U.S. and U.S. businesses. Um, we are we are hurting our energy industry, which we have always been able to maintain in the last four years of the Trump administration, energy independence and an ability to be able to help our allies. And we're totally going against that. Environmentally, we also have to deal with those batteries uh, yeah. over the course of time, which will be very substantial. I don't think we're thinking about that. But, you know, even more worrisome to me is the fact that we now have government telling you what kind of vehicle you should drive instead of letting market force determine that. Isn't that on the way to totalitarianism? Yes. And, you know, you asked what, what's the Biden administration thinking? What it would seem is that they want 100 percent control. They're telling you where you can buy it, how much you're going to spend for it, you know, how much you're going to spend on it um, and what you can purchase as opposed to allowing, you know, uh, market demands Right. To, to dictate that, um, they they are the ones who have their finger right now on that lever, and it, again, it's it's making us uncompetitive. You talked about regulations at the beginning of the hour, uh, talking about EPA regulations and and how that is causing everything to increase in cost, but also decrease in the amount of volume of energy that we're producing. So our our need for energy hasn't decreased. Right. So what we're having to do now is look at other places for it. And when you think about how it is produced in the U.S., we produce energy cleaner than any other country. But we're looking and relying now on other countries to provide it that don't that don't produce it as cleanly. And we're not able to provide our allies with that clean energy. Now we've actually reached the point where we're empowering Putin. Because, yes. uh, you know, at the rate things are going, he can drag the war out for years. He doesn't care because he's getting plenty of money coming in. And uh, all, of he's, all he's doing is draining our coffers. If we continue to say, regardless of what anything, we're just going to continue to, to pour money into something that is never ending, uh, we've got a real problem, particularly if Russia and China are working together. Russia drain our resources. China get ready to attack us when we get to our weakest ebb. Yeah. Do, 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 does our leadership have any concept of any of that kind of stuff? If you're judging them by the policies and the rhetoric that's coming out of the White House, I would say no. I would say, you know, you've got you've got at least a, a, a small majority, but a majority in the House that are very much aware of what the threat uh, from Russia, very much aware of the threat from China. And we're trying everything that we can do to combat it. But unfortunately, the people that we're having to fight are the very people who are in the White House that should be up to speed and who, whose interest in America should be number one. But it doesn't seem as if it is judging by their policies and judging by their rhetoric. Well, how, how worried are you about China? Are they just a, a big paper tiger or is there something more going on there? I, I don't think that you can overstress the risk that um, that China poses to the U.S. right now, whether or not it's deciding who is going to be um, in charge of currency in the future, you know, whether or not we're looking at China or, or, or U.S., um, whether or not you're looking at our, our energy supply. If we're all driving EV vehicles, but we can't provide um, an opportunity for people to be able to plug them in, and yet China is the one supplying, you know, all the materials for it, you know, what, what's happening. And even at a, at a, at a much more um, global basis, I've been traveling as part of my um, commitment to the Ways and Means Committee and looking at trade. And I've been to South Korea. I've been to Singapore and Cambodia, um, Mexico. We are losing the fight with China. China is engaged in those conversations with um, foreign countries around the world. Um, they are selling out their futures to China, whether or not it's their infrastructure, whether or not it's their rare, rare earth minerals. Though China has been very aggressive um, and very proactive in, in, in forming those relationships with our allies. And U.S., especially in the last two years, has just been silent. Mm -hmm. When you talk to foreign ministers, when you talk to prime ministers around the country, around the world, you know, they'll tell you, where's the U.S.? And China is in our back door. I mean, when I was with the, the prime minister of, of Cambodia, he said, you know, um, we would love to be working with the U.S., but we're starving right now. China is offering us a bowl of rice. We want to eat a Big Mac, but the U.S. is nowhere around. 
when you hear those stories over and over again and you recognize not, not only what we're doing to our own country, the infighting, the uh, demonization of U.S. businesses, but then when you see what China's doing with the rest of the world, their long-term strategic plan, you just shake your head. When I was with the foreign minister of Singapore, we had a very honest discussion about where um, where the U.S. strength was. And, and he said, look, the rest of us are seeing the fact that you guys are having conversations about what defines a man and a woman. The rest of the country, the rest of the world is focused on, on feeding people, is focused on, on, on their infrastructure. Um, we really needed to get it together and, and quickly. These, these side, these side arguments that are just so silly, um, really are not the, fo the, the future of our country. I mean, I, I talk to a lot of people in other countries and they all have a common question for me. What happened to you guys? <laughs> they can't even understand how we can be going off the cliff so quickly. And, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're discarding a lot of our values and the principles that guided us in the past, which is sort of sure. chucking them in the wastebasket. And uh, it's not helping us at all. No, and it's distracting. It's distracting. There are things that we should be able to agree on. I think 99% of the people agree on, but we're distracted by that 1%. And, you know, you're losing the 99 for the one. And, and that's, that's, it's not a smart, it's not a smart strategy. And I think we're better than that. And I think we can be better than that. The conversations and the bills that you see coming from the floor of the house right now, I think are showing you our focus. We're looking at helping working families. We're looking at decreasing um, inflation. And that's where our focus and our conversations need to be. You know, small businesses are the backbone of this country. You know, 60% of people are employed by small businesses. But, uh, you know, what, what the heck is happening to them? They're being hit by inflation, you know, the uh, rising interest rates, uh, access to capital problems, labor shortages. You can't find anybody who wants to work. Uh, what can we do to help them? I just, I feel so badly for them. You know, the first thing, I guess there's a number of things that I've heard, but the first thing that I've heard from small businesses, because I look, when I was mayor of Irving, that was my focus, was bringing businesses to our city um, because what it did was it increased the quality of life for your citizens. Three quarters of our tax base was paid for by business taxes. So three quarters of our police, our fire, our sidewalks, our roads, our schools, our libraries, our rec centers were paid for by businesses um, and, and not by the residents who lived here. It also gave residents an opportunity to have a job. Those were jobs that they could put money into their own banks. They could pay their own way. They could be um, self-sustaining, but they could also invest in their future. So that is a focus of mine, and it's always been a focus of mine during my 12 years as a local elected official. But when you ask, you know, what do small businesses want? They want you to get out of the way. They don't want you know, the government to sit here and constantly change the rules. They can play by the rules if they know what they are. But when they consistently have a government that comes in and changes them um, nonstop and adds more regulation, adds more layers of bureaucracy, it adds to the cost. We had a great um, witness last year who came up and there was a uh, there was a, a, another regulation that the Biden administration was looking to put in. And we had a small business owner who came to our committee and he had a four ring, a four inch, a three ring binder. And he said, this is what this regulation means to me. I don't have a separate uh, a department that deals with this. I don't have attorneys that work on staff. I'm going to have to hire somebody to be able to figure out what I'm supposed to do with this one regulation. This is going to cost me $100,000 a year. I don't have it. That's not, that's not in our margin. So if you pass this regulation, I go out of business. That really hurt. Um, and, and hit home to even the, the Democrats on our committee is how we are overburdening these small businesses with regulatory issues yeah. and regula regulations that, that, that don't do anything to add to safety or precautions. It's just another bureaucracy that we are feeding. That's number one. The second thing that they've asked is at least provide some consistency. So can do we know what's happening in the future? 
The third thing that they've, they've asked is stop competing with us. Stop competing with us from a federal perspective. For example, when you said going after um, um, trying to find funds. Right now, this administration is trying to increase the size of the Small Business Administration to be able to compete with private banks. It makes no sense. Um, but they also are competing to keep people um, out of the workforce. When we're paying people more to stay at home, when we're giving them all of the benefits that you would get if you were to work, you're taking away the incentive of people to go to work. Those are the things that we've heard um, mo more often than not, but the inflation is killing them and we have to do everything that we can to stop that, which includes, by the way, going after regulations that are increasing the cost of business. Well, the you know, Small Business Administration uh, supposedly has oversight of the, the PPP program. Um, yeah. And it seems like there's been a lot of fraud and stuff there. Uh, is, is, is that, I mean, I was talking to a woman in Texas not too long ago who recently lost her husband. Her financial situation was devastated. And, uh, I mean, she was on the verge of being homeless. And she said uh, the, the local housing uh, authorities said there's no more money. They, they can't help them. All that money that was designated in the post-COVID or pre-post-COVID area, what what happened to all that money? Who's? <laughs> I mean, is anybody paying attention to it? Well, I'm the chairman now of Oversight for Small Business, our Small Business Committee, and we are definitely looking at that. We had um, some of our um, um, IGs, offices of our uh, IGs in, um, in front of our committee, uh, last month, and what they said was shocking. Uh, how much money has gone out fraudulently? How much has been sent out of the country? Uh, and we're not. What we've had the Small Business Administration do is, if they, those 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 loans, if those amounts were under a hundred thousand, they're just dropping them. Um, mm. And that's billions, billions of dollars that were fraudulently um, given away that we're, what I've heard is we're never going to get back. Um, but before we make that mistake again, what are we putting, you know, what kind of um, um, rules, regulations are we putting in place that prevents that from happening? Um, we wanted to give money out to people to be able to, to help them when they were hurting the most. But I think uh, Democrats, the second round, um, really were not paying attention to what happened the first time, which was paying people more to stay home our men to go to work and we need to get this country back to work. Um, we had one and during one of our ways and means meetings, we had one of our, uh, our members, uh, Mike Kelly asked the question to, uh, one of our, 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 our bureaucrats about, you know, are you back in the office? And the guy said, yes. Yeah. So we're definitely back in the office. And he had a picture of the parking lot and it was nearly empty. And it was like Wednesday at one o'clock or Wednesday at three o'clock. And it was like basically empty. And it's like, no, you're not back to work. And people all around the, the country are feeling it. Yeah. Well, you know, during the uh, Trump administration, we made a big effort to get rid of a lot of regulations. Yeah. You know, at HUD alone, we got rid of more than 2,000 regulations and sub-regulations. And I, I think that helped to create an environment that was very good yeah. for business. Uh, and th th this administration seems to be loading the regulations back on. What uh, What is the impact of regulations, particularly on the small business entities? Um, I think we've already talked a little bit about it. There, you know, we don't think about how much time small businesses are spending not doing their core job, which is providing either a product or a service to the public, which is working with their staff, training, um, just being out and marketing what they do, but they're stuck working on regulations that are costly. It costs everybody more money. When a small business has to pay somebody to make sure that they are, 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 are following all of the neat rules that we set up for them, we ultimately that cost comes out. Um, and, and people who are using that product, using that service are having to pay more because the business owner is having to pay more. Where it makes sense is one thing. But where it's do you know it's, it's it's duplicative, where it doesn't make any sense, where you're basically just paying somebody's salary in the federal government, and you know we talked about this when 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 we were working at HUD, um, they had so many regulations on, for example, building material, mm -hmm. building material that hadn't been used since the 70s, but we still had to force people to do testing on, 
even though they knew that they weren't going to find that material because it hadn't been used in decades, or perhaps it was only used in the Northeast and were making people in the West check for it. Those made no sense. One of the bills that I tried to pass last session, which I'm going to be reintroducing this year, is uh, had to do with regulations. And you could not have a regulation. You could not add a regulation unless it was budget negative or budget neutral. So you're not growing the size of government, and it would force the um, the agencies to have to get rid of regulations in order to increase any additional. We don't do that enough. Yeah, I love that. That well, you know, Biden's uh, 2024 budget uh, has uh, several tax increases in it as well. Yeah, but that obviously can't be particularly helpful for the small business community. No, no. Taxes are never very helpful for the small business community. We tend to we tend to lose that. When I had Secretary Yellen in front of our committee uh, uh, a month ago, uh, I, I asked her about the policies that were coming out because overwhelmingly, what we've heard from our small business community is these these taxes are killing us and they're affecting us. She kept being very, very uh, aggressive and saying that no, these these taxes aren't going to affect anybody making less than four hundred thousand dollars. And when I started asking her about the cost of food, about the cost of energy, anybody who puts gas in their tank right now is paying more. You're paying more in gas tax, for example. Um, while wages may have increased, the value of the dollar has decreased. You know, if you look at the 14 plus percent of inflation since Biden took office, people are that's that's, that's more than a month of a paycheck that people are losing to inflation. So while they may say that, oh, no, people under making under $400,000 aren't going to be affected, the fact is, yes, they are. And for them not to realize it, admit it, and do something about it is terrible. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, I sat on a board with Janet Yellen, and she was much more sensitive and intact to what was going on with people at that time. It's kind of interesting. But... Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about your, your Caudel to uh, Latin America. I know you had a chance to talk with Mexican President uh, Obrador. Um, the, the border problem, mm -hmm. is there hope for us there? You know, we saw hope. Uh, during President Trump's administration, we saw hope. We saw what strength could get us. Um, and, and you know Mike Pompeo very well. Um, I'm, I've spent some time um, visiting with him about his strategy in Mexico. And it's amazing when you go down and you speak with a Mexican president and you say, look, we need to have a strong partnership between the U.S. And, Mex and, and Mexico. When you think about the threat that we're facing from other areas of the world, China in particular, if a very strong partnership could be phenomenal, not just for our two countries, but for the world, yes. what we would be able to do um, with manufacturing alone. Um, we need to have a very strong relationship, but, but the conversation that we had with President Obrador was, was, was horrific. Mm -hmm. um, we are seeing untold numbers of people go through his com country to come illegally into ours. These include people who are sex trafficking, who are drug trafficking, um, and who are on the terrorist watch list. And we don't see a president in Obrador that's taking this at all seriously, that is looking to protect his country, much less our country. What we do see is um, um, drug cartel and human trafficking cartels in his country that are making billions of dollars at our expense. They are targeting our youth with fentanyl. We've had over 107,000 people die from mm -hmm. fentanyl that is being brought into his country from China is being created into other types of drugs. Um, it's being laced into anything from, from Xanax to, um, to uh, you know, drugs that look like uh, uh, candy for our kids, look like rainbow candy. And he is not taking that seriously at all. In fact, what he did was he blamed the U.S. He blamed U.S. parents for bringing up, you know, um, kids who are, are, are addicted to drugs. When I explained to him, I've talked to parents in my in my district who've lost children to fentanyl, who have said that they were trying to buy something that they thought was a prescription drug to be able to do better on their SATs to get into college. These are not kids who are being abandoned by their parents. Um, but the fact is, is that they are targeting our youth, and we have a president in Obrador who's not taking it seriously. We also have a president in Biden 
who is basically allowing this to happen. They are a drug cartel dream team. They are not monitoring what's happening at our border. We're seeing millions of people being let in our, our communities, are being flown there at taxpayer expense, dropped off, and then never heard from again. But we're also seeing a brand new time of narco slavery in our country, where we are having people who are brought, children included, who are being brought on, on, on uh, farms, illegal marijuana farms, worked to death. They are being put in meat packing plants, working, you know, the graveyard shift at the tender age of 14. This is happening under Biden's watch. And Obrador is blaming the U.S. He's saying that uh, we have drug traffickers here, that it's not in Mexico, that he's not going to do anything to help us because we're paranoid. That there is no safety, there is no safety issues in Mexico. It is Republicans being paranoid. Is, this, it, is, is it also true? that some of the other countries are releasing their worst criminal elements and mentally ill people to come to our country, or is that? It would seem so. It would seem so. When you think about who we're meeting at the border, just the few that we have actually caught compared to the few that we that have been let in that we don't know about, it would seem as if that's happening. Wow. If you looked at what happened in the week that before we went to Mexico, um, the, the four uh, tourists who were attacked, two of them murdered, um, but four of them that were kidnapped. You look at the hundred thousand of people that are lost in Mexico. Um, we have no idea what's happened to them. That's what's happening under this president. And instead of willing to be able to work with us, um, he's turning a blind eye and basically being very critical of, of U.S. parenthood. Um, but the fact is, is that when you had a strong leader in the White House who went down and spoke to Mexico, very much leading from strength, you did not see what was happening at the border right now, which is a human catastrophe. Mm. But it's also, it, it, it's horrific for the future of our country. Yeah. Weak leadership in the White House is a direct result. And it's allowing people like Obrador to continue with that negative and nasty uh, narrative. Well, it's, it's hard to even understand what is driving the administration because if you have anything that even resembles a neuron up there, uh, you, you recognize that these things are going to lead us into a very bad place in the future. And I was just thinking, I want my power now. I want what I can do right now. And I don't care about the future. Uh, obviously, that's part of the thinking because yeah. the, the national debt is being increased at, at dramatic levels. And uh, that's going to affect the future of our citizens who are going to be paying so much money just to service the debt. There's, there's been a lot of controversy lately about women's sports. A yeah. couple of weeks ago, Riley Gaines was on our podcast talking about competing against men in women's sports. What's happening to us in this regard? It's, how, how does this make any sense whatsoever? And why is the women's movement not right on the forefront of fighting against it? That's a great question. Um, we had a press conference because of this past week we just did, uh, we just passed a bill related to this, saving women in, in uh, women's sports, you know, protecting women in women's sports. Um, it seems as if they're just trying to um, negate the fact that we've got women um, <laughs> negate all of our uh, accomplishments um, for anybody who has ever competed in in a sport recognizes that yes women are equal but different you know we don't have as much body mass We're, we tend to be smaller right. um, don't have as much strength we don't have testosterone for example and forcing us to compete in these um, you know, whether it's it's swimming or weightlifting or volleyball, it's dangerous. And we've seen examples of, of that. And yet we still have a very, very tiny, small percentage, a, min a minority of our country. And that is pushing this. And it's at, literally, it's at the risk of over 50% of our population. Um, I think women have an opportunity to be able to compete on the, on a sports field with other biological women um, and to suggest that uh, in everything else we're somehow different, but in sports we're the same and built the same. It's dangerous. It's having a horrible effect on our, on our, on our female youth. Absolutely. I, and and I, don't, I don't understand it. Can you imagine what the impact is on children? 
yeah. uh, growing up and being told that you might be a girl, you might be a boy. Uh, you know, the traditional methods of determining that are no longer valid. I mean, it, it's almost as if we've lost our minds. Again, the vast majority of, of individuals would not, uh, would not be supportive of this. They're not supportive of this. And yet we see a very small minority pushing it. And that seems to be who this White House is supporting. It's a very small group of, of minority, but not, not, uh, not, not nearly all of the, the women, um, not even the majority of women. Well, Congresswoman, you've been a, an outstanding proponent for the pro-life movement. And uh, we really appreciate that. So many millions of lives being lost. And uh, were you, as a woman, always pro-life? Or if not, how did you come to be pro-life? I appreciate that question. Um, my dad is an OBGYN. And um, he has always come home. And um, when I was very young, uh, he had a profound uh effect on my life and in me pretty much always being pro-life ever since I was a small child. And he would talk about his job, um, not often, but in a, in a way that I really appreciated. Um, you know, I, I appreciated pregnancy and I appreciated birth. Um, I think what we're seeing right now is so many youth are, are being told that this is a woman's issue. Well, it is a woman's issue. Women are the ones who have babies and they, they, they should think about that is such a miracle to happen. But what we're seeing is a, a Democrat party that has gone so, so far to the left. I mean, I was on the floor of the House last year when um, everyone but one Democrat voted to allow abortion up until the moment of birth. Previously, that had been unheard of in our country. Yeah. Um, we had never we had never had that before. So yeah, I, I've always grown up just believing that um, um, life is sacred and that we should we should do everything that we can to preserve it and save it. But you know, I'm also a mother of two, um, and actually, I was a mother of three. Um, I had I had a miscarriage with my first child. And I do. It's something I do talk about because I think it's important when when you have when you have birthed a child and you've seen what your body can can produce and the miracle that that is. You have a lot better understanding and I think a better appreciation for it. But when you've also lost a child and you have felt that just amazing um, um, emptiness, when we when we so freely throw out abortion as if it's just you know you're taking an aspirin. Um, we, we fail to recognize what that causes, that the loss that that will cause to women who have had abortions over, over their lifetime. Um, we don't give it enough thought. We don't give it enough credit. And I think, quite honestly, we need to be a lot more sensitive in how we approach this subject. Absolutely. Um, we can judge all we want, but it doesn't help. Providing women with the support that they need and a clear path to something other than abortion, um, I think is a much it's a much stronger um, um, strategy to take. I think it's a lot more supportive. I think it, and overall, it's a lot more effective. I would hope that uh, people would uh, put a little more emphasis on adoption too. It is so expensive and so difficult to adopt an American baby. That's why people adopt them from other countries. Uh, we need to fix that in a hurry because uh, some women are just simply not in a position to, to take care of a child. Uh, but if there was a good alternative, I think they would feel much better about themselves. But uh, yeah. things that we just need to be concentrating on. Well, I want to just take this opportunity to thank you, Beth. I mean, you are an incredible patriot, an incredible servant of the people an incredible example of what's supposed to happen in a representative government, in a democratic republic such as we have. And I, I hope you will be an inspiration to many others to join. Uh, that's why we have the Executive Branch for America program, encouraging people to join, understand what's going on in government, because it's our citizens like you who are willing to get into the fray and work for the common good, which was a phrase that was used so often by our founders and demonstrated so well by our early settlers. 
the common good. That's what America is all about. So thank you. And uh, I'm sure we're going to be seeing a lot more from you. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate all the work that you've done. You've been a phenomenal mentor. You've been a wonderful leader. Um, I, and I'm so happy that uh, you're staying engaged. And uh, the work that your institute is doing is just absolutely incredible. And, uh, and I thank you for it. Thank you. Well, it was great having a chance to catch up with uh, Congresswoman Beth Van Dyne. Uh, she was terrific to work with when she was the regional administrator for HUD in the Southwest region. Just did a spectacular job and got around to so many of the areas where people were just flabbergasted. They said, we've never seen a regional administrator before. Uh, but the regional administrators are the people who actually the arms and legs who actually get stuff done for the agency. So we commend her for all the work that she did then and for the, her courage for standing up for what's right now as a congressperson. Now, you know, we are nearing our one year anniversary of the launch of this podcast. And I want to hear from you. I want to hear who you think we should have on what topics you think we should be covering. Give us some general feedback. So uh, let me know by emailing ben at americancornerstone.org. Remember, Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe, or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure you don't miss any issues. And uh, also, make sure that you uh, rate us and review us and uh, tell your friends and neighbors about us because we need to keep spreading common sense. Common sense needs to become common once again. And remember the cornerstones, faith, liberty, community, and life. We'll see you next week.